Father, again, we're so thankful that we have access into your presence, that we, that we have a God who loves us, who is sovereign, and who has given us his word for what he wants us to know. We're thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to feast upon it, for our spiritual nourishment comes from feasting upon the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit be the one who guides us. May truth be sealed to our hearts, and may any error or foolishness or ignorance just be stripped away from that which is spoken. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I've received a lot of questions about uh, a particular verse in Scripture that I want to address before we continue on with our series of studies in Colossians. 1 Timothy chapter 2, the first four verses. In looking at this epistle, we see that the Holy Spirit has been giving a charge to Timothy in the church through the Apostle Paul on being solid in biblical doctrine and in charging those that depart from uh, biblical doctrine, realizing that a departure from true doctrine leads to false doctrine, to a different doctrine and the teaching of law. You'll see that in chapter 1. Rather than recognizing the grace of God that, that's revealed in the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The exhortation begins with the fact that we should be in prayer. We're told that we should pray always, that we have boldness and access into His very presence. We have boldness to enter into the presence of our Father who redeemed us, who loved us with an everlasting love and who, as we know, is working in us to will and to do of His good pleasure, and that we are to pray for all men. And this for a specific reason, which we are given in this passage. And the passage reveals that reason, but in particular for leaders in government, the powers that be, because they are ordained of God. God has determined who our leaders are. His purpose is best. It, it may not be ours. You know, we may be more interested in other things, but our God is directing the course of all the nations, and He's doing that according to His will. Our leaders are ordained of God, and so we are to pray for them. I prayed for Obama. I pray for Trump. And he's doing that according to his will. And to suggest that we speak in, in disparaging terms and refuse to pray for them is, is basically tantamount to, to saying that we disagree with those whom God has put in office. And the reason that they're over us, whether we realize it or not, from God's standpoint, is given us here in the text. It is that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in, in all godliness and honesty. It isn't the Christian who ought to be organizing some overthrow of the government. Daniel was taken captive by the Babylonians and he, and he served faithfully in the Babylonian government. The Persians came in and took the city and Daniel became a faithful servant wasn't Daniel's job to decide who was in authority. It was Daniel's job to serve the Lord. You know, it isn't so much that he resisted. He did not obey the decree from, from Darius that he not make any petition other than to the king, for, because, for that would be contrary to his responsibility before God. But he was absolutely submissive to the law. And so they, they then take him and they, they throw him in the lion's den. Folks, we are to pray for the leaders God has put in office and our prayer is to be such that we may lead a peaceful, quiet life with respect to the government. We may not lead a peaceful and quiet life with respect to those who are anti-God and want to put us to death. 
The very government that Paul prayed for, folks, put him in prison and eventually beheaded him. But he didn't speak against the government. That is my point. It was the government that God had ordained that put him to death. Same is true of our Savior. And that's up to God. We don't question God. God has told us that praying for those in authority leads us to living a quiet, peaceful life in godliness and honesty. The word godliness is a word that means a reverence, uh, a piety toward God, not toward the kings and those in authority, which, which is for us quiet and peaceful. Life is reverence toward God. Even if those in authority put us in prison, we can sing psalms to our Lord and our God and do that in honesty. The word honesty there might be better translated uh, dignity. Our Christian life ought to be lived in reverence toward God and in dignity. And the minute that the flesh comes into our worship, we become less reverent. And I'm fully aware of the fact that we there's a great movement today to get away from the stiff-necked, you know, uh, uh, church uh, services of 400, 500 years ago. But these men referenced God, and they recognized that to come into God's presence was a grave and a serious responsibility. I've heard people describe God the way they, they think that He is, and it's nothing like the God that I see in Scripture. The God I see is sovereign. The God that I see is all-powerful. The God that I see is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He sees everything I do. The God that I see in that book is a God who loves me with an everlasting love, and all I can do is fall before Him and worship Him. I shouldn't be redeemed. You know, I should go to hell. But God Almighty became my kinsman redeemer, and he took my judgment, dying in my place. The seriousness of this context that we're looking at here is in the fact that when we recognize that authority is placed there by God, as Christians, we recognize that our God is in control. We're not. He's running the affairs of the state. I want you to... to I'm trying to drive home the point, folks, that we're looking at God's sovereignty standing out in the text big time. And that's important concerning what we're fixing to talk about, what I'm getting ready to, to talk about here. You know, the, they, they're often deceived and corrupt, poli you know, politics, governments, but they are there by God's appointment and they are there for our good that we may live a peaceful life and that we should live with reverent respect toward God, realizing that it's God who placed them there. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, who is our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so now I suppose I've got to tell you folks, well, I guess i got to apologize for teaching that horrible doctrine of election. You know, we, we now have to cast aside all of the emphasis that we've that we've seen regarding God's will and God's sovereignty, including total depravity, divine election, in fact, just grace itself, just toss that all out the window. You know, it shouldn't come as a shock to any of you that we just can't do that, folks. We can't do that. That is not being consistent with this book, with our study of that book. That's, that is not consistent theology. It's not us being consistent in our theology. This is, of course, a passage of Scripture. I'm sure that many of you are well aware of this, that has occasioned much, well, to put it mildly, discussion. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, Literally, the Savior of us, God, is what it says in the Greek. Not one hint that the Holy Spirit has anyone in mind here, but a message directed toward you regarding a matter pertaining to 
are living a peaceful, quiet life in regard to the authorities that we are to pray for that God has ordained. Who is our Savior? The modern church, in their urgency, I guess, to deal with the subject of, of salvation more than the subject of God's sovereignty, the, the deity of Christ, have little considered the meaning of words. Listen carefully. Regeneration has to do with dead creatures, dead people, folks. Okay? New birth has to do with dead creatures. Salvation, rescue, deliverance, all the same word, has to do with living creatures. Regeneration deals with dead creatures. God's people, sheep, wheat, God's family, children of promise, need to be regenerated. The elect need regenerated. Those he chose need regenerated. Dead in our own sin. We need to be regenerated. Forget about being saved. We need to be regenerated because we're dead. Now, once we're regenerated, we need to be saved, rescued, rescued from sin, rescued from doubt, rescued from fear, rescued from fear of death. And that rescue, that salvation has to do with living creatures. That's, that's what I'm trying to impress upon you here. Nobody can be saved who isn't already spiritually alive. My sheep hear my voice and I give them eternal life. Why don't you believe me? Because you're not my sheep. And folks, I didn't say that. I didn't make that up. God said that. John chapter 10. Only God's sheep will believe. If you're not already one of His sheep, born by the, the Word of God, born by the will of God, then you cannot be saved. Okay? You are redeemed to be saved. You're redeemed to be delivered. You're redeemed to be rescued. And with deliverance, salvation, the fear goes, the doubt goes. You know, we trust Him. That's how we're rescued. But that's not how we're redeemed. Redemption or, or regeneration is the work of God. Salvation or rescue is also His work by implanting faith in us that we trust Him. I've, I've referred to this in, in other verses of Scripture. He came unto His own. He came to deliver His people from their sins. They're already His people. Those are the ones He's saving. He's saving His people. He's not saving Satan's people and making them His people. They're already His people. Thou shalt call His name Emmanuel, for He shall save His people from their sins. They are regenerated. They are His people. He did that. There is no place in all of God's Word where, the, where you are regenerated by personal faith. doesn't happen. If you've come to the point of personal faith, it is because you have been redeemed. Paul was belonged to God before his Damascus Road experience, his conversion. Purchased by his blood, bought back. A sheep who was lost, brought back into the fold. He found you. You didn't stumble upon him. He wasn't lost. You were. You didn't go seeking Him. No man seeks after God. He found you. Modern Christianity wants us to believe that we found Him. He wasn't lost. You were. He found you. The idea that, that we find Him is a lie, folks. Every single Bible on the planet clearly states the opposite. You are regenerated by the Word of God, by the will of God, not by anything you do. You're not born physically by anything you do. You're, you're not born spiritually by anything you do. That's why God used the illustration of birth. That's regeneration. That's the work of God. After He's done that, after, after He's regenerated you, He now asks you to trust Him and to believe Him. And, of course, you won't do that 
So he gives you faith, that faith so that you might trust him and believe him. And every one of us knows that that's a fight. You know, people tell me how much they trust and love the Lord and then, and then bam, they lose a job. The car gets towed. You know, a child dies. They have a serious automobile accident. Something happens. They have some disaster and they're at their wits end. You know, how are they going to live? What are they going to do? What have we done wrong that this happened to, to us? Why is God pick, picking on us and not on other people? I mean, those are all terrible thoughts. Why can't the thought be, all right, Lord, you're the one who loves me. You're the one who died in my place. I trust you no matter what comes. I trust you. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. No wonder there's a peace that passes understanding. No wonder there's a joy that's unspeakable. Those who are not Christ's don't have that. They don't have a total assurance that God loves them. And nothing, nothing, folks, touches our lives that don't come through His program and His plan. So we are regenerated by the will of God. We are rescued, saved, delivered because we're already alive and we trust Him that He's the one who's delivering us. We're going to be with Him hopefully sooner than, than later. I don't think it'll be much longer. So we have evangelists who say, you know, do you want to be saved and accept Christ as your own personal Savior? You're now born again. That's not how you're born again. You don't have any passage of Scripture. Hear me, please. No place do you have a single passage, not one, of Scripture that says you're born again if you do something. If you trust Him, if you believe Him, if you accept Him, if you walk the sawdust, you know, trail, the aisle, shake the pastor's hand, be baptized, fill in the blanks. Or if you make Him Lord of your life. I have gone over this over and over again. It is important because it's the gospel. It's important because God's people in the main don't know this simple biblical truth. That they've been born again by God according to the will of God. It is a passive voice. I pointed this out in, in many previous studies. By the will of God, not my will. The active voice in the grammar, folks. The subject does the action. We do it. The passive voice, the subject is acted upon by an external source. And, and in, the, in this case, that source is God. Now, when I trust Him, I am delivered. I'm saved, rescued. And what a marvelous deliverance that is. How do you know the peace of God if you don't trust Him? We are alive and He gives us the faith to trust Him and to believe Him. We came to, to, we came to Him because He first found us. We love Him because He first loved us. He came to seek and to save the lost to save that which is His, and He did it. Folks, He did it. We are His, and we have peace with God because we know a God who is in control and who directs our lives, who will have, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and come to the experiential knowledge of the truth. That's the word is epikonosko. It's an experiential knowledge. This text does not say who will have all men to be regenerated. It doesn't say that. And you cannot take the word saved and say, and, and say that that means regeneration. I've been told five times by the Holy Spirit that I was born from above by God, not by me, not by anything I did, not by in my own faith, my own acceptance, but by the will of God. Think about it, folks. Where do you find a passage of Scripture that says that a goat ever became a sheep or a sheep ever became a goat, for that matter? When you plant a seed, what do you get? You get what the seed was when you planted it. If I go out here and I plant squash, squash is going to come up. 
not corn. At least in the world that I live in. No place was any indication ever given that tear would become wheat or wheat would become tear. Just doesn't happen. We are his people and we were regenerated by his will and the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ is to deliver us, deliver us, save us from sin who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The favorite verse, I know, of all Arminians, you know, let's translate it in a, in a, in a, in a very popular way, who wishes that all men would be uh, saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, he's this loving, white-haired, elderly gentleman, you know, in heaven, sitting in his rocking chair, wishing, oh, oh, how he's wishing so much that people would come to him and believe and, and be born again, that they would do something so that they'd be saved. And that picture says that he's not sovereign. And that's why modern evangelists have to face the fact that obviously God can't be in control. That, that man overrules God's will. Therefore, they make the statement that God never overrules man's will, so he wishes that all men would be saved, when in fact, let me tell you for a fact, God overrules man's will as it concerns his elect, his people. He has to. Otherwise, you'd go to hell. You were spiritually dead. You had to be made alive first. He does overrule men's will, those who are his. So, you know, they, they want to tell, tell you that God never overrules man's will. That he wishes that all men would be saved. He just wishes and wishes and wishes and wishes and wishes. First, well, of course, we know that all men aren't. So he's done a lot of wishing for nothing. Folks, listen to me. Look, first of all, I don't think you can do that with, with the word thalo there in the Greek. First of all, a wish is a desire, and God says, whatsoever he desired, he did, in heaven and in earth and in all deep places. So if he desires this, he's going to do it. And of course, he did do it. So you can't get out of the force of the verse by simply saying, well, you know, this is something God wishes would happen, but he can't make it happen. You know, or he has this, he has two, I've heard this, you know, he's got a, he's got a, he's got a permissive will, which is different than his absolute will. So he's got two wills. They go, the. They go in two, they split and go in two different. That's not true. So now we have much less than, than a sovereign God, and that's just unacceptable, folks, in this verse. You can't do that with the Greek word will, desire. You know, some people translate it wish, but you can't separate God's wish from God's desire, from God's determinate will. Whatsoever pleased God that he did. So if this is what he wishes, that's what he does. We have the phrase, all men. Does that mean every single human that ever lived? Well, obviously that can't be true. You know, Cain's called one who's an enemy of God. Judas, he's, he's called the son of perdition. Jezebel, you know, well, she's called one who was, who was against God more than any human probably whoever lived and clearly there are those who are going to be in hell and then in, in the book of revelation we clearly see that the antichrist who is a human and the false prophet these are humans not angelic creatures same is true of them jacob i loved esau I hated god doesn't wish that all men be redeemed the words don't say that he wishes all men he wishes all men to be redeemed. Stop, folks, and think. 
It's not consistent theology. He doesn't use that word. He uses the word save. The lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his messengers, and, and Satan arrays his messengers, even his messengers of light, so it can't mean God wishes all men be redeemed. The meaning of these words have to be determined by the context. If God wishes that everybody who ever lived was, was rescued, then he's, he's a very poor God. You know, because he wishes, he desires something that he can't bring to pass. And it surprises me that Bible scholars don't reason with through that conundrum, dilemma. That, that they don't reason with that fact. To say that God desires that all men be saved is to say that he will save them. So if we say that all men here means everybody, then folks, we got a real Big problem. Ephesians, in whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And we just read, God wills that all men be saved. Am I to believe that he works all things after the counsel of his own will except this one thing? You can't have that contradiction. Please, dearly beloved, don't, don't come to a conclusion that contradicts other Scripture. Therefore I said unto you, John 6, that no man can come unto me except it be given him of the Father. If he wills that everybody come, why don't they all come? That won't work. But all of his people, folks, will be saved because he has willed that they be, in the end, ultimately saved. The redeemed of God. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, Revelation 5, 9, which must include those who never heard the name Jesus Christ, never heard his name, never saw a missionary, never had, held a Bible, never went to church, never said it, never uttered one single prayer. Another fact that seems to be conveniently ignored by modern evangelism that rejects the biblical doctrine of divine election. If the synergistic, legalistic, conditional, Arminian, human merit-based view that the world religious evangelical system promotes is true. That a dead man makes a decision. That Lazarus rose himself from the dead by, by, by doing something. That a dead man makes a decision for, for Christ before he's born from above by God. How do they explain that fact? Well, they can't. They can't. The passage is referring to we who have been regenerated, being rescued, delivered, saved in the context of our understanding that it is God, a sovereign God, who has placed those in authority over us that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. What cannot work here in this text is the Arminian approach that God sits up there it just wishes and wishes and wishes that all men would come to him and be redeemed. That cannot work. It is anti-biblical, and it absolutely blasphemes the character of the sovereign God that we know and, and we worship. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. To this very day, God has given them that spirit of stupor. Romans 11, 8. And then we see who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That is all men, his people, to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It's not complicated, folks. We just have to be, when handling the Word of God, consistent in our theology. Look, I love you all. I truly do.
Rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.